All right, uh, let's get started. Again, some um, announcements first. So hopefully you saw that I posted the practice exam so um, or the practice midterm. So you can find it on Courseworks. Uh, please have a look. The actual midterm will have very much the same structure as uh, the practice exam. Obviously, the questions will be different, but the material will be very similar, and the questions will be posed in a similar way. And I'll probably post the, um, the answers to the practice exam um, Thursday or Friday. Also, so there was a question about um, having a cheat sheet for the exam. Um, so please look at the thread on Piazza. Basically, the policy is that you're allowed to have a single-sided one page of a cheat sheet to bring into the midterm. And, um, but you're required to post your cheat sheet on Piazza on Sunday night in the thread. And please don't open another thread because I don't want 200 threads on Piazza. Um, so the idea, yeah? Well, the slides are definitely on the website. Um, no, okay, maybe, maybe they are not. I thought I uploaded them. Maybe I f forgot to call make. I thought I, they, they are. It's the wrong one. You're right, okay. Well, that's slightly embarrassing. Um, I'll fix that so you can follow along. Give me one second. Okay, sorry about that, so it should be all set now. Um, okay, so that, that was the announcement. So look at the practice exam, and if you want to, make a, uh, if you want to use a sheet sheet for the exam, uh, make one before Sunday and submit it on Piazza. So, yeah? Uh, no, so next week, so Monday's class will not be part of the exam. Uh, Monday's class will be part of the final exam. Um, so you can study over the weekend and don't have to rush on Tuesday. Um, other questions about the exam or logistics? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about uh, model interpretation and feature selection. Um, so uh, today I'll only co uh, cover what's known as uh, maybe post hoc explainability or, well, or model interpretation where basically you have uh, more or less a black box model and you're trying to interpret um, what this model does. So we'll also talk a little bit about interpreting linear models, but mostly I will talk about black box models. There's also um, another line of work that is about how can we build models that are interpretable. And um, there's maybe a little bit of that in the homework, but we're not gonna have a lecture on like, how to build interpretable models. But this is also a huge area of research. So um, we basically assume that we use uh, any of the models we talked about so far, 
and we then want to, after we fit the model, we want to try to understand what is it that the model learned. One of the things that um, is very important here is that model interpretation is not the same as inference. In particular, it's not the same as causal inference. Um, very commonly, you uh, want to make causal inferences about what's happening in the world. Say, uh, does X cause Y? Um, and so, um, model interpretation usually doesn't give you a causal framework. In particular, um, if you want to make causal interpretation, so saying something costs something else, it's very dependent on how you collected the data. And um, I think there's a, I'm not sure if it is this semester, but commonly there's like, there's a whole class on causal inference. And um, if you want to do causal inference, you need to understand causal inference. Um, any of the techniques that we're talking about today are not causal inference. So they might point in some direction, but they will not allow you to say X caused Y. However, they might still be useful in that they might inform uh, experiments you want to do. They might inform you how to do um, further exploration of the data. They might uh, give you some idea of how the model uh, work. There's uh, mainly two types of explanations for black box models, um, global explanations and local explanations. And uh, we'll only consider, uh, um, or yeah, mostly consider talking about global um, explanations. And so global explanations want to explain for the whole data set, how does the output depend on the input in particular, how does the output depend on a particular feature? Um, whereas local explanations are about single data points, like why was a particular point classified in this way? So um, the difference might be that, let's say you do like a, a credit scoring model or something like this. And so the, uh, a global explanation would be like, uh, if you have a longer credit history, then you get a better credit score. But um, a local model would be like, why does this particular person have this particular credit score? In particular, if things are about people, you often want to be able to explain why was a particular decision made? Um, so yeah, there's like a lot of implications in making um, real world decisions based on black box models. And some uh, researchers say that's a bad thing to do overall. But um, if you make a decision based on a black box model, at least it would be good to have an idea of uh, why this decision was made. One of the ways to pose this question is to say, what is the minimum change I need uh, to do to a data point to classify it differently. So um, let's say you said, oh, this person uh, doesn't qualify for this job. What is the minimum change in the features I have about this person that um, I would need to make to, so they would be classified as qualifying for this job? And um, Coming back to something that I alluded to in the very beginning, let's say the minimum change is, oh, if I change their gender and then the, their classification changes, maybe this is not a, a good model because it tells me that if I change something that shouldn't have an influence, um, the outcome changes. Um, so, again, uh, having explanations is not sort of a cure-all. Oh, actually, on, um, before I forget, on Friday, there's an amazing talk in the um, Data Science for Social Good that's both about explainability and ethics uh, by uh, Zach Lipton, and you should all go. Uh, I think you need to book it on, um, you need to get an Eventbrite ticket, but there are still tickets online. So it's at, at the Data Science Institute, Data Science for Social Good, and uh, he's like, an, uh, he does amazing work in ethics. And explainability. That's just a side note. 
Uh, another caveat to the uh, explanations are that explaining the model is not as the same as explaining the data. So even if I have uh, some explanation of the model, and even if my, if I, my model is uh, very easy to understand, let's say my model is a linear model. If I have, say, five features and I have a linear model, I can more or less perfectly understand what the model is doing. I can look at the coefficients and I know if I change this in the input, this will change in the output. That doesn't mean that you're explaining a data. So um, there might be things in the data that are not captured by the model. In particular, if you have a simple model like a linear model and there's interactions in the data or nonlinear effects, then the model might not capture these effects. And so even though you can perfectly um, explain the model, it doesn't allow you to perfectly explain the data. Even if you, uh, uh, so generally, if your model is very accurate, you assume it reflects the effects in the data better. But it might still, might be accurate, but still um, pick up on some spurious effects in the data. So uh, even an accurate model might not really reflect um, the underlying data entirely. So, so now it's actually, after all these caveats, go to um, ways that we can explain models. One thing that people are often interested in is what are the important feature, what are the features that are important to the model? Um, what are the, th uh, the features that really influence the model's decision? <coughs> this is usually the, the first level of interpretation or explanation people are trying to, uh, to make. And these would be, uh, as I said, these would be global explanations because they're like, these are features that are globally important for this model. Um, two that are readily available, um, and I call them here naive because they have like uh, a couple of caveats, but they can still be useful, is for any linear models, you can look at the coefficients. So a linear model actually would be um, usually considered an interpretable model, at least as you, if you don't have like tens of thousands of features, because you can write down the whole model, and um, so the coefficients actually reflect the whole model. <laughs> The coefficients also tell you which features are important um, with some caveats. Another thing that's readily available in scikit-learn is feature importances for tree-based models. So um, gradient boosting, random forest, and decision trees, they all have these feature importances. The feature importances, um, I think I mentioned them in the, in the tree lecture, what they capture is the mean impurity decrease based on a given feature. So basically it counts, whenever you split on the feature, how much did you decrease the impurity? And if you don't use the feature, then the uh, feature importance is zero. This is a very fast approximation or a fast like way to figure out which features are important. However, um, it can be biased because it uses training set statistics. So the feature importance is are how much did impurity decrease on the training set when we did this fitting? And so because they are like the statistics that are used during fitting, they can be overfitting and um, misleading. So I'll talk about a couple of other uh, methods in a little bit. There's been like uh, basically a whole campaign of people saying uh, you shouldn't be using the standard feature importances in random forests because they're uh, they can be so misleading. Maybe I wouldn't go as far as like, saying like don't use them, but there, there's better ways uh, to compute feature importances. Just a, a side note for linear models. Um, the relative importance are, is are only meaningful if you scale the data. So if you don't scale your data and if you don't scale all the features in the same way, then one coefficient being bigger than another coefficient doesn't really have a meaning. 
if, if you do um, a standard scalar and all of them are zero mean invariants, then you can measure the relative importance of the features by uh, either using um, the square of the feature or more commonly the absolute value of the feature. We already discussed this a little bit in um, the lecture on uh, linear models, but if there's correlations among features, the coefficients might become completely uninterpretable. So if you have two features that are highly correlated, you might get one of them have a very large positive coefficient and one of them have a very large negative coefficient, but they usually cancel each other out. And so uh, the effect that um, these correlated features have cannot be readily seen from the coefficients. If we use uh, L1 regularization in linear models, um, I think I already also mentioned that in the linear model lecture, then uh, basically the fitting will pick more or less at random one feature from a correlated group of features. So if you have two copies of a feature, you will have a, a non-zero, and let's say it's an informative feature. You have a, two copies of an informative feature, then um, Lasso or L1 regularized logistic regression will pick one of them. And it doesn't mean that the other one is useless, but it just means that uh, it doesn't add to the feature that's already there. So these two features could basically, they could be the, a copy of the same feature. So they could be, have exactly the same importance, but one of them has a coefficient of zero and the other one might have a big coefficient. And so in that sense, be careful in saying the f uh, things that have zero coefficient are not useful. And so if you use any penalty, L1 or L2, these shrink the coefficients towards zero. And so um, in sort of an idealized statistics world where um, there's no correlations between features and um, the matrix is uh, not ill-conditioned, um, you have the interpretation, and everything is scaled, you have the interpretation that basically um, the coefficient is um, exactly the marginal contribution of each feature. And so basically, if you, um, in the data, if you say, raise one feature by one unit, um, then the, this corresponds to a change in the target by one, uh, one times the coefficient. But if you regularize the model, it's not going to be an unbiased estimate anymore. And so um, the magnitude and direction of the features might still be informative, but it is, does not have the same interpretation as uh, if you don't have a, a regularized model. All right. So this was all the, uh, just repeating some of the caveats that we talked about when discussing linear models. Now I want to go to um, different black box estimates of um, finding feature importances for models. Um, the first one is one that's sort of quite simple to understand, but it's not very commonly used for feature importances. It's more commonly used for feature selection, and we'll talk about this in a little bit later in the lecture. We, um, it's commonly referred to as drop feature importance. Um, the idea behind drop feature importance is that you look at the model that you trained on your whole data set, then you drop a single feature. So here I is always the index of the feature and X uh, minus I means I take the data set where I drop the feature um, with index I. And so I can compute the accuracy of the original model and the accuracy, excuse me, of a model where I dropped feature i. And I compute the difference, and the difference tells me, difference tells me how important that feature was. There's, um, so this is pretty natural. However, um, you can't really just drop a feature uh, from a model. If you have a random forest classifier or 
a neural network or something like this, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to leave out feature i. So um, to compute this, what you would usually do is you train a new model, which I called f prime, on the data set without the feature. And so here, um, the scores, I said accuracy to, for, to simplify it, but it could be obviously any scoring metric that you're interested in. And so you can compute the cross-validated score on the original data set and the cross-validated uh, score on the data set where you drop feature i, and that gives you an importance of uh, this feature. So this is pr a pretty natural way. So basically, if you, c yeah? Uh, yes, so just to repeat, base, um, if the features are uncorrelated and are single scale, then you have like, I mean, I didn't do the stati standard statistical interpretation, but then there's like a very clear, obvious uh, interpretation. If you apply penalization, this interpretation is no longer true um, in the strictest sense. And so I think there's still useful information, but basically the standards uh, statements that you could make in statistics about uh, what the coefficients mean are no longer true if you have any penal penalty. Um, people still regularly look at them and they still give you some information, but um, the interpretation like is not as obvious. Or let's, let me say this. The interpretation in terms of the data is not as obvious. Um, so again, maybe it's useful to um, Distinguish what you know about the data and what you know about the model. So obviously the prediction of the model behaves exactly as what the coefficient says. How you fit the model doesn't uh, change what the prediction, how the predictions of the models are made. But um, the inference you can usually make about what it means about the data changes if you use um, yeah, uh, penalization. Okay, so um, moving on to the drop feature importance again. So um, yeah, the reason why this is not really used for inspecting models is because you're not actually comparing uh, the model to like, or you're not really, you're comparing two models, the model with um, all of the features and the model with the feature missing. And so you're not really actually making a statement about the original model, you're making a relative statement between two models. And so that's like, um, maybe not entirely what you want, but um, it tells you in principle how important this feature is. Um, or, so hmm, maybe to illustrate why this is not entirely what you want. So this basically makes more um, a statement about the data and less about the model, um, because assume that um, you have uh, two copies of the feature that are really, really informative. The, the first, the model that you're interested in, F, let's say it was like an L1 penalized uh, model, and so it picked only feature one. So it only used feature one. Um, and so let's say it has very high accuracy. Now I look at the uh, drop feature importance where I dropped feature one. The other feature I'm, I have, um, leftover is also explains the target. So the accuracy with the feature one dropped will also be very high. And so um, basically the feature importance of both of the features will be very low because if you drop either of them, the other one um, can still compensate for it. <laughs> However, the original model that we're actually interested in, the model F, used only one of these two features. But the drop feature importance doesn't tell you which one it used. Okay, this is the place where I apologize. I have a lot of bullet points today, and I should have had a lot of graphics, but I didn't have time to make all the nice illustrative graphics that I would like to do. Um, all right, so. Well, 
here you're setting a feature basically to zero and see how well kind of models will cope. And this is applicable to any possible model. So in a sense, everything we talk about, nearly everything we talk about is conceptually similar to Lasso in that it tries to figure out what are the important features. But uh, this is a method you can apply to any, um, to any model. All right. So, yeah, so downsides of this is it doesn't actually explain the model really. Um, and um, it's very slow because you have to refit the model over and over again. A more commonly used technique that is sort of a pretty classical technique is uh, called permutation importance. The idea in permutation importance is very similar, but um, <coughs> instead of uh, dropping a feature, we replace a feature with um, an uninformative variant. So again, we compute, say, the accuracy or whatever score of our original model, and then um, we take the same model, the model that we're interested in, and now for the ith column, we shuffle the ith column. That's why it's called permutation importance. So um, that means the feature in column i are just reordered. Shuffling is basically a way to sample from the data distribution for this feature, ignoring all the other features. So in a sense, you um, what it says is, well, um, Look at the prediction made if I, if I average over all the possible values for this feature, um, taking the expectation over the data distribution. And so I'm like slightly abusing notation here, but the idea is that, um, so basically we draw the, uh, X, the feature xi is just drawn from the univariate data distribution for xi, and then it's placed in the ith column. And so I also gave you an implementation here, basically, which says, well, I'm going to, I is called FIDX here. And um, basically, I shuffle this feature, so I destroy any possible relationship this feature might have to the target without changing its distribution. And I see how much does this um, change the, uh, the prediction by the model. In contrast to what the drop feature importance, you're not refitting the model. You fix the model, and you're doing this on a validation set. And so this tells you actually how much does this model rely on this particular feature. Oh, and so what I also did in this code here is I did have this B IDX, which is the number of, well, I call it bootstraps, but it's maybe I should just, just, just call it repetitions. Um, so we want to estimate this expectation where we draw uh, from the data distribution. And so if you shuffle the data, basically for each data point, you replace it. Um, with uh, one sample where you sample the point, um, the, the feature value xi. But we want to actually compute an expectation, so we want to sample this multiple times. And sampling the feature multiple times is um, equivalent to shuffling uh, the column multiple times. So I shuffle it, say, 100 times, um, and uh, then I, um, for each of them, I compute the score, and then I average the scores. And this gives me some the expectation over uh, basically integrating out this feature. This is also kind of slow, because, um, well, you have to do a bunch of these repetitions, but it's not too bad. So this is the way that um, is more recommended, say, for doing random forest feature importances. The feature, the random forest dot feature importance, so for any of the other tree-based models, the feature importances are just always calculated in training. This takes some amount of time. 
Um, but this will be more accurate as it is done on a validation data set. Oh, and um, I didn't put this on the slide here, but you don't have to implement this yourself. Basically, the point of showing the implementation was to give you a better idea of how this works. There's an implementation in scikit-learn in the inspection module. So from sklearn.inspection, import, permuta import uh, permutation importance, and it does this, and obviously it's like fancier than this in a little bit in that it makes sure it cut catches all corner cases, but in essence, this is what it does. In a sense, I would say this is one of the gold standards for feature importance. Um, was actually proposed by Bryman in the paper in which he proposed random forests. Uh, this was the way that he used to explain what random forests do. I think it was the original paper or in one of his follow-up papers. I want to walk through um, a toy example with this, but before I do that, I want to um, introduce two more recent measures. So this um, area of interpretability has become like a really big area in machine learning research over say the last uh, three or four years maybe. Um, and there's like probably hundreds of methods. Um, there's one that kind of started it, which I want to mention, which is called Lime. And so there's this paper um, that I think was one of the first that um, in this uh, area of interpretable machine learning called Why Should I Trust You? Explaining the predictions of any classifier. And the method that they implemented uh, is called Lime. And so they wanted to implement the predictions, meaning they wanted to give local explanations. So the main idea behind Lime is being able to have local explanations. And so given, so this is a picture from their paper. Uh, let's say you have the two classes, the red and the blue, and um, there's a decision boundary. Let's say you have some neural network or maybe a support vector machine that learned this decision boundary. And now you want to say, um, for this red cross here, you want to ask the model, or we want to know um, why was it classified as a red uh, cross as, exp uh, as opposed to a blue circle. And the way that line does that is it builds a sparse linear model around each data point. So if you want to ask a question about this, it will sample points in the neighborhood so these are these points here and these points here. Then it will train an, a one regularized um, model. And then it will look at the coefficients of this model. And it will do this like, uh, I think several times and aggregate it. So you have a more robust estimate. But the point is you basically, you find this, um, find a linear model that locally approximates your nonlinear model. And once you have this linear model, you can interpret it, it the same way you would interpret a linear model usually. And so it tells you, well, um, for this particular data point, this linear model is a good local approximation. And so I know this feature is important, this feature is important. Or if I change this feature in this direction, I would get this prediction. This is something that's, um, I think, still used by some people in industry and it's sort of one of the standard methods. but it's been a while since, um, or like, I don't think it's been um, like that much used uh, in research recently because like there's been a bunch of follow-up work since then. If you want to uh, try it out, there's actually a library called Eli5, so explain to me like I'm five, um, that has a bunch of interpretability um, functions in it and has this one, or I think the the link that I gave here is the original implementation of the author of the line paper. Uh, one that, uh, another explanation method that is, um, that people love recently is called SHAP. And so I'm not actually gonna go into all the details of SHAP. Um, so there's like, if you're inter interested in interpretability, definitely um, uh, look at the paper for this. So it's built around this idea of shapely values. 
and um, in a sense, it does something like the dropout importance, or maybe actually I should have said something more like the permutation importance for every subset of features. So it doesn't want to just look at what happens if I remove one feature at a time, but for each possible subset, what happens if I remove that subset? Um, obviously, if you have like any number of features, there's like exponentially many subsets. So this is intractable, and so they give some um, um, approximations, I should say exists, not exit. Um, and so they have one general um, approximation based on kernels, and then they have um, a specialized one based uh, for tree and a specialized one for linear models. Uh, and, and in these cases, you can basically compute this in uh, closed form. Otherwise, you need to do some approximation. Uh, one of the reasons I think wh why people like this, I mean, there's two reasons I think. A, the math behind it is kind of nice in that it um, has like some um, very natural properties about what it means for a feature to be important. It can give you local and global explanations. So you can ask, why is a feature important for a single data point? Or you can ask, um, what are globally the important features? And then there's also a lot of cool tooling. So if you go to this uh, repo with Shap, they have uh, quite a bit of documentation and they have like interactive visualizations for, for uh, several different models. And so they have very nice tooling around this method. And I think this is probably the interpretation method that I've seen most used in industry. Um, it's a little bit, I think, it has nice properties, but to me, it's like still a little bit hard to understand, and so it's um, uh, I think the, the standard permutation importance is slightly easier conceptually, um, but Chap definitely has some uh, some nice properties that um, maybe you don't get from permutation importance. Oh, I linked. Um, two papers in the, in the schedule, no, not two papers, two books, actually, that talk about interpretable machine learning. They're both from a group in Munich. One is basically how to do interpretable machine learning. The other one is why doesn't it work? And um, they're both very good, and they go into much more detail. And so um, during this lecture, we're not going to have time to dive deep into all of these methods, but I highly recommend looking at this book. Wow, and I'm like on slide 11 after 30 minutes, so that's not good. Um, so, after 40 minutes. So let's go through a case study. So I'm gonna just go over this uh, toy data set, which um, here I have like eight features, and it's a regression data set, and um, basically, the features four, five, six, and seven are just completely random, so they have nothing to do with the target. Uh, feature one and two are very informative, and uh, but they are highly highly anticorrelated. And feature two and three are also informative, and also highly anticorrelated. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a nasty data set if you run a standard regression model on it, because the correlation will trip you up. So most of these. Um, interpretation methods have a hard time with highly correlated features. And so if you want an interpretable model, maybe the better way to do, go about it would be try to remove correlated features before you do anything. And so um, we'll see some methods for this in a bit. But so for now, assume you didn't clean up your data and your data has like pretty strong correlations. And so um, if we build a model on this, one thing we could expect is that um, for an L1 penalized model, we would expect it picks out one of these two and one of these two and doesn't do anything else. <laughs> um, for any other model, it probably uses both of these and both of these. And ideally, it should probably assign similar importance to both of these features because they're basically the same. So here there's um, a couple of models I'm uh, just uh, running. 
which are lasso, ridge, linear regression, decision trees, and random forests. Um, and I regularized the random forests uh, a little bit. The synthetic data and the model is actually linear, so the linear models sort of have a slight unfair advantage. So this is um, what I maybe call like the naive thing, which is, I mean, it's not that naive for linear models, but it might be a little bit naive for uh, trees and random forest, which is just looking at either coefficients or at feature importances. So these are sort of the, the built-in ways to inspect the model. And so, I mean, I constructed this data set in like a slightly weird way. And so but we can see the things that we expected. So for the lasso, you can see that feature number zero is um, basically negatively correlated with the target or has a negative impact on the target, which is what you would expect. So there's a negative slope in feature zero. Uh, lasso then, as I predicted, doesn't use feature one because feature one is redundant, but it's feature zero. And which of the two it picked basically is up to the noise. And then um, Lasso also did uh, picked feature two, and it has positive um, a positive relationship with feature two. Sorry, which is also what we would expect. Um, good, and uh, it doesn't use feature three, and the uh, impact of Feature two is clearly bigger, uh, smaller than feature zero, which is also what we would expect from the plot and from the way I generated the data, basically. So if we look at um, rich regression, then um, you can see the coefficient for feature zero and for feature one. Um, they go in opposite directions that are basically the same. So here you can see rich regression actually gives you the same amount of um, importance for both of them gives you the correct direction um, because like, yeah. And um, so basically what you had in Lasso here is evenly distributed between these two features. So if you stack the orange bars, you'll probably approximately get the, the blue bar and same here, you have, um, it uses again both features. Um, so here, so here you can see how the, the difference in behavior with correlated features with L1 and L2. So L2 basically will spread out the importance as much as possible because large coefficients are penalized by the square and L1 uh, will use as few coefficients as possible. If you look at log, uh, linear regression, so I, I call it LR here, uh, linear regression um, basically go, goes completely off the rails, which is expected. So these, these bars are like way above here. Um, and so you can't really see that. And so the, the sign of this one here is not the sign we would expect. Um, so we know the impact of this feature is negative, but um, because of cancellation effect, the thing that linear regression does um, is, yeah, doesn't really make sense at all. But yeah, this is expected if you have correlated features. Then I have the tree in the random forest here. Um, and so plotting them in the same plot is like maybe slightly confusing because um, these are importances. The importances are always positive. So they don't give me a direction. They tell me the min minimum uh, decrease in impurity. And so, um, yeah. They, uh, as I said, so they will always be positive. Um, but I can look at how big they are. So for the tree, the tree gives a lot of importance to the first feature, not that much important to the second feature, and the th or feature one, and then even less to two and three. And then basically it gives nearly near zero importance to all the useless features. So that's a little bit strange because we know that feature zero and feature one should have the same importance. They're basically copies of each other. And, um, but trees, as we know, are very unstable. And so the importances that you get out of them are pretty unstable. 
The random forest, on the other hand, um, because you aggregate many models and the models are somewhat randomized, random forest is more stable and you can see it assigns the same importance to the feature zero and feature one. What you can also see is that the random forest assigns um, quite a bit of importance to the features that are actually useless. That's the main criticism of using this um, uh, impurity uh, uh, improvement criterion um, for feature importances is that it might give non-zero importances to useless features. All right. Um, if we look, so here at the top is the same plot as, as I did before. Um, at the bottom is a uh, comparison to um, permutation importance. And so um, permutation importance, again, is always positive. So here now all numbers are positive and they're more comparable than they were before. Um, for Ridge and Lasso, not much has changed. So for Lasso, we get still that one of the features is important, the other one is not. For Ridge, we get that both of them are important. Um, one thing that is nice is that for the random forest now, um, we see that there is no importance for any of these features. Um, because there shouldn't be any, and so basically we got rid of this um, spurious um, effect of the noise features by, um, by using permutation importance instead of using the impurity criterion. Uh, here is another comparison to the global um, SHAP values. So I just rerun this again. So SHAP values also give you actually a sign. So it gives, they give you um, a directionality Honestly, I was a little bit confused by this um, because the directionality is not what I would have expected. Um, and so honestly, maybe you shouldn't read too much into this because um, so ideally it should give you a directionality, but the directionality are not correct. And also you ha uh, here are um, to get importance for some of the noise features. And actually, I've, yeah, so I probably did something wrong because that is not really what I would expect. And so I, I tried to debug it for a while, but I couldn't figure out what I did wrong. Um, but I will, I will try again. And uh, oh yeah, feel free to uh, play around with this. The notebooks are online as usual and uh, maybe you can figure it out. So this is also not like the ideal application of SHAP values because the main strength of SHAP values is to have local explanations. And here basically average the local explanations over everything to get global explanations. All right. So that was feature importances. Feature importances are nice but they are very, um, very coarse grained. In particular, like some of them, the, like the permutation importance, they don't get, even give me a direction. There's another method that is um, pretty classical, I would say, for understanding uh, black box models, which is called partial dependence plots. Partial dependence plots try to not only tell you how important the feature is, but exactly how it interacts with the prediction for a given model. And so the formula looks like maybe slightly similar to implementation importance, but it's computed in a quite a different way. So what um, a partial dependence plot or partial dependence gives you is a one dimensional function so for each index i, so for each feature i, I get a function that tells me um, what is the expected prediction given just this feature value if I marginalize out or average out all the other features. So here I do the expected value over all the other features holding one feature fixed. 
The way this is computed is actually um, quite trivial, at least a brute force way, which is you take your um, a validation data set, and let's say I want to compute the partial dependence for the first feature. Uh, to do that, I first look at the range of the first feature. I'd say, okay, my feature goes from uh, 1 to 10, um, or from, let's say from 0 to 10. And so to compute a partial dependence, I plug in uh, for the first feature, for my whole validation data set, I always replace the first row with 0, and I average the result. Then I replace the first row with 1, and I average the result. And then with 2, and I average the result and so on. And so this way I get a curve that tells me if I fix the first feature at zero, what's the average value? If I fix the first feature at one, what's the average value? And so on. Um, here's an example on the, the Boston housing data set, which is no longer my favorite housing data set, but um, I already had uh, that on the slide. So here we, I'm training a gradient boosting regressor model. And um, then I call plot partial dependence, which is in, actually it's no longer in the ensemble mo uh, module, it's in the inspection module. Um, and then I call plot partial dependence on the model. One thing I should have said on the last slide is, for all the tree-based models, you can actually do it in a smarter way. Um, so you don't have to do the brute force way and if, and if you do the smart uh, thing for trees, you don't need the validation set. So then you can actually, you basically only need the ranges of the features. So here I'm providing X train, um, but because it is the, a tree based model, the method doesn't actually use X train and so it's fine. Uh, generally, if you use um, an arbitrary model, you should use the validation data set. Um, because otherwise you get a biased estimate. And then I can say, well, okay, what are the, the features I want to uh, show? And here what I'm saying is, I'm actually, I'm using the, the slow bad feature importances, uh, sorry, the fast bad feature importances, and I take the first, um, the six most important features and I visualize them. And because I did it weirdly, they're ordered in the this one is the most important one. And so here you can see this um, 1D function that is the average if you plug in a particular value. So this point here is made by plugging in the amount of room is 5.5 um, for uh, all, the po uh, all the points in my data set basically. Um, and then I compute the average response of my model. And the average response is um, well, minus, minus two. This, uh, so this is relative to the mean prediction. So basically, if your um, uh, room, if your number of rooms is 5.5, you're um, like, let's say, three lower than uh, the mean prediction. And so what you can see here is the, well, as the name says, it's the partial dependence of the model on an individual feature. And so you can say here, basically, if, if the number of rooms changes, the prediction of the model changes this way. If, like, as the age of the uh, how home changes, this is how the, the prediction changes. And so you can see the direction, but you can see uh, much more than the direction. You can see the direct effect. Again, I want to repeat the caveat that this is about uh, what the model learned, not necessarily about the data. You can extend this to uh, multiple features. Uh, usually people don't do more than two because two is the most that uh, we can visualize easily. And so instead of Fixing one feature, we can fix a pair of features. So let's say I'm in, I found out, oh, these two variables are interesting. I want to see, is there any interaction? And so um, 
I fix LSAT at 4 and room at 5.5 and um, plug this into my data set and average over all the other over all the values. And then this, uh, this value here is the average prediction for this. And so basically I go over this whole grid, I fix at this pair of values, at this pair of values, and so on. And this way I can see if there's, uh, if there's interactions. You can also do the same thing for classification, but it's a little bit harder to read. This is a partial dependence plot on, um, on the iris data set that we all love. And um, so, as you hopefully remember from the, um, from the gradient boosting lecture, gradient boosting uses a log loss. So this is basic, or in the case of multi-class, it uses a multinomial loss. So these are basically the input to the multinomial loss. And so um, if you look at the sepal length, this is the input, this is the partial dependence um, of basically the, the score that goes into the, the, um, the softmax for Setosa. This is the score that goes into softmax for Versicolor. This is the uh, score that goes into softmax for uh, Reginica. And you can see, for example, that if the pedal width is slow, the probability of the Setosa is high. If the pedal width is like in the center, then the probability of Versi color is mm -hmm. high, and if the uh, pedal width is large, then the um, probability of uh, Virginia Ica is high. And so these are the scores that go into the probability estimates. So these um, partial dependence can be uh, useful, but there again, there's like a couple of caveats. So one caveat is it only looks at the marginals. So unless you look at the interaction between a particular pair of features, it doesn't model the interaction. It also lo looks only at average effects. Um, so the inter looking at interactions and also um, if they're highly correlated features, the outcomes might also be like uh, strange. One of the issues, um, however, um, there's a, a bit of a fix, so, but um, not for all the issues. One of the caveats is that, as I said, it looks at average effects. So let's, so this is a different data set. This uh, data set I made up just this morning. And um, so let's see, this is my target. I, I didn't label it. I should, I would subtract some points for that. And um, so the target has like, a mean of around 0.5 and it goes from like minus two to two. Okay, I look at the partial dependence plot. The partial dependence plot for this feature that I called feature is uh, about between minus 0 0.05 and 0 0.5. Uh, so this is, if you look at the magnitude, it's very small compared to the target. If I looked at this uh, partial dependence plot, I would say this feature is not important, important because the scale of the of the y-axis is so small. So the relative impact of this feature on the prediction is very small. But then I look at the data and I see this. So here, oh my God, again, I didn't label it. Um, this, so on the x-axis is the feature and on the y-axis is the target. So there's very clearly a um, relationship between the feature and the target, but there's, uh, but the average relationship is basically zero. So if you average out the effect, there's no effect. But if you look at, there's clearly there's two groups in the data. And for one of the groups, it has a positive effect. And for the other one, it has a negative effect. If you just look at the partial dependence plot, you can't see that. There's a thing called icebox that fixes this. Icebox is, um, a partial dependence plot, only you don't compute the mean in the end. And I love how, okay, the thing I love most about this is someone uh, there to give it a name to not to compute the mean in the end, but uh, it's called Icebox now. And so basically, 
when you compute a partial dependence plot, as I said, for each point, um, you replace whatever the feature value was with the fixed value you're interested in. So here, uh, to compute it at this place, I replace the feature with minus one for the whole data set, and then I average this. It, that's the partial dependence plot. However, I can also not average it and just look at each data point as a, a curve. And so here, each of these black lines corresponds to a data point in the data set. And what happens to it if I replace the feature with a different value? And you can see here now, there's clearly two different groups. And for one group in the data set, there's a positive effect. And for one group in the data set, there's a negative effect. And if you average them out, you get a flat line. So at least in this uh, example, uh, it looks helpful. And it definitely gives you a more fine-grained picture. I'm not sure if this is something that would happen in, in the real world very commonly. But at least it gives you an additional um, visual debugging tool. Right now, this is not implemented in scikit-learn. And so there's like two Python implementations that I mentioned here at the bottom. Um, there's also a pull request for scikit-learn. So in the next version, it will probably be in. And so, yeah. So this is a very simple uh, extension of partial dependence plots that looks at individual level dependencies. This still doesn't solve the problem about uh, interactions and it doesn't solve the problem of correlated features. All right, so we have 10 more minutes. And so I'll at least start on uh, talking about feature selection. And I guess we'll talk a little bit more about feature selection on Wednesday. So first thing I want to talk about in feature selection is why do you want to do feature selection? I think the most common motivation for feature selection that I've seen is to get more interpretable models. Um, so this ties in directly with um, what we just did. Basically, if you have less features to put into your model, then the model will be easier to interpret. You also will get faster prediction and training time, and you will have less storage for your model and your data set. Um, I think something I saw, have commonly seen is that people try to do feature selection to avoid overfitting and get better models. I'm not sure how much this is true in practice. Usually, you put the feature into the model because you thought it was important. And even if it's not important, most models can actually learn that a feature is not important. And so I think very rarely will doing automatic feature selection improve the accuracy of a model. So if you want just to have a very accurate model, maybe you don't bother doing feature selection. If you want to have a very small and compact model, or a model that you can uh, interpret more easily, then feature selection uh, might be useful for you. But uh, don't ba basically don't try to grid search over all possible feature selection methods uh, with the hope that at some point your results will get better, because they won't. So. There's um, several different classes of feature selection. Um, the biggest differentiation, I think, is unsupervised versus supervised feature selection. And I'll mostly talk about supervised feature selection today. Then there's um, univariate versus multivariate feature selection. And then there's feature selection that is based on a particular model versus those that are not. And so let me start, well, actually, uh, OK. So maybe just, um, the, I mean, the main difference is in univariate feature selection, you look at one feature at a time. 
and see if you should drop it or not, whereas in multivariate, you look at, uh, at multiple features at a time. Um, so in terms of unsupervised feature selection, um, this might be useful if you want um, an interpretable model or a model that, um, which you can use for statistical inference. So in statistics, dropping correlated features is a very common practice. In terms of predictive modeling, I would say that um, even if features are correlated, you might still um, discard information. So it's unclear that the even those features are highly correlated, they might, the, uh, there might not be any information in it. So basically the main unsupervised feature selection techniques are uh, those that are, if something has zero variance or is mostly constant, it's probably gonna be useless, and so you can discard it. That's not the same as if something has a small variance. If something has small variance, it just means you didn't scale it. But if a feature is zero most of the time and it's like 10 twice, then maybe you can discard the feature because it's not very informative. As I said, so um, removing correlated, correlated features is one of the most common unsupervised techniques. And so um, it's good for uh, inference because basically it doesn't, um, really taint your statistical inference that you do afterwards. If you use any supervised uh, feature selection, um, we basically saw this in uh, when I talked about pipelines. If you do any supervised feature selection, then you can't do statistical inference afterwards, or not easily at least. Something that's not really feature selection, but it's also um, sort of in a similar vein is principal component analysis. We'll talk about principal component analysis after the after spring break. PCA basically removes linear subspaces. And so PCA removes the, uh, reduces the number of features without actually, um, or without removing individual features, but it removes um, subspaces in a way that preserves as much information as possible. So it's less likely that you're you discard important information if you use PCA than if you just remove features. The downside is that um, the features you get from PCA will not be as interpretable as the original features. Um, there's, right now there is no automatic unsupervised feature selection in scikit-learn. There might be the next version, but it might also be good to just look at your covariance matrix and look at um, what are the feature features that are correlated and which of these do you want to drop. So if you just plot the covariance matrix, this is again on the Boston housing data set, you might have something like this. And so if something plots something like this, I'll scowl at them and tell them to do it again. This is, I think, a very useless plot of a covariance matrix. The reason is that I just ordered the rows the way they were in a data set, but this doesn't necessarily allow me to show where the correlations are. If I reorder the columns, then um, I can see much more clearly what the structure of the data set is. So here, the left and the right are the same matrix with reordered rows and columns. The way I did it here is using scipy dendrograms, I think if you just use Seaborn and Seaborn, there's just a single line to order the, uh, the correlation matrix or covariance matrix. Yeah, but so the thing on the right, please, please, please never plot this um, because it's very hard to see any structure in this data. So maybe if you're lucky, you could say here that um, rat and tax are correlated um, but other than that, it's very hard to see anything else. Whereas here you can see very clearly that this variable is sort of on its own. And then there's this block of variables that are pretty correlated. These are very highly correlated and so on. So you can see like the correlation structure of the data clearly on the left, but very not, on the, not clearly on the right. Okay. Um, So 
So for supervised feature selection, cool. Okay, apparently the power doesn't work up here. Um, so for supervised feature selection, um, the most simple one is univariate based on univariate statistics. And so basically you can pick a statistic and then check the p-value and if the p-value is uh, small enough, you say you keep the feature, otherwise you discard the feature. Um, or you look at the f-values, which are sometimes more stable. So um, in the feature selection module, there's a couple of them. So there's f-regression, uh, there's f-classification, which is actually a t-test, and uh, chi-square, and there's also mutual information. And so basically, you pick one of these um, test statistics, it will apply it independently to each of the features, and um, you can see here, well, the room variable in this data set and the LSAT variable are the most important one, uh, according to these universe statistics. To actually do feature selection with them, you can use uh, a feature selection transformer in scikit-learn. So there's um, many, many of them. In particular, there's select k best, which selects the k highest scoring features, select percentile, which selects the percentile of the features, and there's uh, select FPR, which selects with the guaranteed false positive rate, like a limited false positive rate. And there's one that has select FDR, which is a, a limited false discovery rate. So these use some statistical um, corrections to make sure you don't select too many features. Um, but yeah, so you could also just use select k best and then grid search the feature selection or something like this if you want. And so to use this, I use my uh, selectors. So this is a cycler estimator. It's a transformer. I set how many features I want to keep. And I specify the score function. So here I use f regression. Uh, I fit it on the train data set, which just computes the statistics. And then if I do call transform, it will just subset the features to the features that the two features that are most useful. And so here in this case, basically the ones with the smallest p-value are the two features uh, with the smallest p-value are the two that I kept. And so um, still on the Boston housing data set here, I'm comparing um, just using all of the features um, in the pipeline of the standard scalar and rich regression with just using the two most important features um, in a pipeline with standard scalar and rich regression. And you can see, okay, the, the um, R squared drops quite a bit, but actually if you think about um, using 13 features versus using two features, these two features actually capture a whole lot of variance. So, uh, compared to the 11 other features, these two features basically explain most of it. Um, another scoring function I just wanted to mention uh, separately is uh, mutual in information. Uh, mutual information is um, works slightly different than the other ones in that the chi-squared, f-regression, and f-classification, they all basically um, look at correlations or at linear relationships. Mutual information is a nearest neighbor-based non-parametric estimate, so this can also take into account uh, nonlinear relationships. Um, it, and it can also directly work with discrete features. Here I'm comparing mutual info score and F values on this data set, they're not that different on this data set, but um, let's say if you look at um, F regression or a, a t-test, if um, your data or like your target uh, has a nonlinear relationship on a feature, so let's say you have like a parabola, then 
it has a very high p-value, right? It's not significant because it's not a linear relationship. But mutual information would be able to pick out nonlinear relationships. All right. So I think um, I'm going to stop here for today. And uh, we'll finish up with the other feature selection techniques on, uh, on Wednesday. No. Monday. Today is Wednesday.